time is now 6.32. We call this meeting of the Goose Creek CISD Board of Trustees to order. Was the meeting properly notified? Yes. Do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. Does the record show all seven board members are in attendance? Before we begin our meeting, as we've been doing in the past, we recite our, we go over our mission and our vision. The Goose Creek CISD, our mission is to developing the whole child. The Goose Creek CISD develops and enhances each learner's intellectual, social, and emotional well-being, facilitated by a highly qualified team committed to growth, community, collaboration, innovation, success, and determination. Our vision is we empower every student with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed in a global community. Our core values are to graduate every child, children first in a safe and nurturing educational environment, collaborative community and parental involvement, integrity, respect, humility, and transparency, service before self, diversity respected. We'll now turn the time over to Dr. Duarte for our opening exercise. President Poppe, school board members, Mr. O'Brien, the opening exercises for the November 5th, 2018 board meeting will be presented by students from Impact Early College High School. We will begin the opening ceremonies with the prayer led by Ricky Clem. Everyone, please rise. Let's all pray together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time when we can come together as a school district to make important decisions that guide the future of our students. We ask for your guidance and wisdom as we go through that course of action. I want to thank you for all our students, all their successes, and especially for those who guide them and teach them from day to day. Uh, we ask for your guidance as we drive home tonight, safe travel, that everybody makes it home safe and sound. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. The pledges will be led by Jennifer Huerta. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now time for the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. The, the following students will talk about the Impact Vivid Garden sponsored by Goose Creek Education Foundation. With us tonight are Stephanie Sotelo, Brian Villapondo, Jennifer Huerta, Anthony Ramirez, Alyssa Vasquez. These students are under the direction of Rachel Jaro, Robin Galvan, and their principal, Laura Reyes. Okay, I'm Stephanie Sotelo. I'm a Impact um, Junior, and I'm the president for Garden Club. This club was started last year when I was current when I was a sophomore, and I'm currently a junior. Um, it was started by two seniors, but you know, senior year is hard, so we just kind of took over, and <laughs> it was it it was a lot of work because well, gardening is a lot of work. We didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Um, we had to de-weed, we had to shovel, everything, everything. Um, but we made it through, and um, it was all help to our two sponsors, our two teachers, and all the group members that are in the group, and we plan to continue it. Um, a, a lot of the stuff that we got was from a grant money from GCTISD, and we got a lot of also recycled products like the crates that we've planted and such things. And we plan to further our garden for the future since we're currently juniors for senior year and continue this year and plan to hand it over to all the following years at Impact. So, and um, right here, Brian Rio Pondo will talk about our future. Hi, my name is Brian Villapondo, and I am the secretary of the Gardening Club. I think we have many exciting plans for our future. First of all, we want to expand our garden. Um, right now, we currently only have it on one side of the pathway. We're thinking about ex uh, expanding it to the other side. And we also want to, um, we created letters that say impact, and you can view it all the way from Market Street. And we also want to paint them and uh, decorate them so it, it makes our school more beautiful. We also uh, want to increase security of the garden so uh, animals don't steal from our <laughs> garden anymore. <laughs> 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 
We also plan on partnering with our uh, with our with our partners in ed in, ed in education uh, to increase our budget so we can hopefully uh, increase our garden and make it more beautiful. Um, we currently have some some gifts for our board members. Uh, we can pass them around. Grown in the garden? Of course. Right. Yay. So in these bags is um, jalapenos, uh, serrano peppers, and basil, all grown from our garden. Thank you. Thank you for your campus beautification. We certainly do appreciate you students. Uh, do you do this during the school day or do you do it during, on your own time before and after school? When does that take place? Well, we do have two, two Saturdays of the month and we just had our Saturday two weeks ago, this Saturday for next week. Anyone can go and volunteer or all the students are open to the club and have this like reminder to show up. Um, and yeah, we have a lot of press in the unit that and this is just every single Saturday, two, two Saturdays a, a month, and whoever just shows up does it. And yeah, we, when we cater to people, it's possible. Fun, fun. You can't go wrong with it. Is, is your garden club associated with any other organizations like the Texas Garden Clubs or National Garden Clubs? No, not, not for right now, but mm -hmm. we do plan on expanding. You know, because we're right now we're small. We just like kind of started. Yeah, we hope to well, I know there's a lot of funding and yeah. grants and scholarships through groups like that for students like yourselves. Maybe y'all can uh, get on HGTV. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing you have to do, and this has always been, you make the rookies weed the garden. <laughs> freshmen. 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 So that's why I was saying freshmen. But the, if you start last, you got to weed the garden. The freshmen don't look too happy about that. <laughs> For funding from the state, but for the benefit of students to receive instruction. Tonight, we are recognizing our top three elementary campuses for the first six weeks. And in first place was Victoria Walker Elementary. They had 98.05% attendance. And representing Victoria Walker is their principal, Monica Juarez, Vanessa Jackson, Campus Student Success Specialist, Ahana Sharma, Pre-K Student, Nathan Rodriguez, Pre-K Student, Jaylene Rocha, Kindergarten, Malachi Gonzalez, First Grade, Lane Moody, Second Grade, Mia Chang, second grade, Marissa Gonzalez, fifth grade, John David Bloom, third grade, and Lexi Poppy, third grade. Our second place elementary school is James Bowie Elementary with 97.59% attendance. And from Bowie Elementary, we have their principal, Regina Sims, Sherry Morgan, secretary, and Geneva Garcia, the attendance clerk.
place, we had Crockett Elementary School with a 97.39% attendance, and representing Crockett is Michelle James, their principal, Ver Veronica Nieto, CS3, Christine Miller, CIS, and we have Ellie Cortez, kindergarten teacher, Melanie Lucatero, kindergarten student, first grader, Janaya Joseph, second grader, Kyle Lebove, third grader, Eric Cervantes, and fifth grader, Ashlyn Kelly. Our top junior school is George H. Gentry Junior School with 97.24% attendance. Here from Gentry are Kathy Holland, principal, Megan Ajim, sixth grade student, Brian Harrow, sixth grade student, Wallace, Wallace Thomas, seventh grader, Capri Anderson, seventh grader, and Michaela Caraballo, eighth grade student. Our top high school is Goose Creek Memorial High School with 95.58% and representing GCM are Canestra Bland, their academic dean, Aaron Salinas, 8th grader, and Brianna Salinas, ninth grader. We also have goals set for our, our alternative campuses, and we had three of our campuses meet the district goal. Impact Early College High School had an attendance rate of 98.46%. From Impact, we have Laura Reyes, principal, Pablo Barron, ninth grader, Emma Davis, 10th grader, and Demarion Liggins, 11th grader, and Julissa Carreño, 12th grader. And we have Robin Galvan with us, and Christy Pisano. Our next alternative campus is Petery Highland Center, and they had 87.66% attendance. With us today are Michelle Verdun, Principal, Jade Ford, and Zulidi Gonzalez.
And last but not least, we have Point Alternative Center, and they had 81.35% attendance. From Point, we have Tricia Times, Principal, Jennifer Herbert, Substitute Teacher, and Student Jelaine Woods, and Heather Henches, ELA Teacher. like to recognize Community Resource Credit Union for their donation of $6,262.65 to provide the new teacher orientation breakfast and lunch. Macy Schubert, Business Development Manager, is with us tonight, and we do want to say thank you, and we appreciate the strong partnership they have with the school district. Connie Tilton, Public and Government Affairs Advisor for ExxonMobil, who's going to come up and be recognized. ExxonMobil has donated $15,000 to the district. The funds will be used for the Goose Creek CISD and ExxonMobil Partners in Education. An amount of $2,500, and wait a second, Carrie, because I want principals to come up. An amount of $2,500 will be allocated for each of the following campuses. So principals, if you are here, please come forward. We've got Victoria Walker Elementary, San Jacinto Elementary, Travis Elementary, Robert E. Lee High School, Baytown Junior School, and Cedar Bayou Junior School. Goose Creek Consolidated Independent School District would like to present Mr. David Yepes, Assistant Principal of George H. Gentry Junior School, as the recipient of the Heroes Award. This award is given to Mr. Yepes for his fearless act of courage and bravery on behalf of our students and staff at Gentry Junior School. His bravery and acute awareness have brought honor to him and our school district. Thank you, David. Educational Theater Association has been has named Philip Morgan, Director of Fine Arts for the Goose Creek Consolidated Independent School District, the recipient of the coveted TETA Founders Award. The award is considered the most prestigious one given by the organization and recognizes outstanding service to TETA and to theater education in the state of Texas. Morgan has been an active member of TETA serving as president-elect from 13, 2013 to 2014, and currently as the chair-elect for the Theater Administrators Conference. He has also served as a critic judge for UIL one-act play competition since 2011, adjudicating the state contest two times in 2015 and 2016. Congratulations, Philip Morgan.
Dr. Bernie Mulvaney received his first state award as an athletic director by receiving the Joe Bill Fox Distinguished Service Award. Mulvaney was rewarded for his efforts during the 10th Annual Texas High School Athletic Directors Association Hall of Honor Program, and I believe he is the first athletic director to receive this award. Congratulations, Dr. Mulvaney. We do want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Thank y'all very much for being here. item on our agenda is citizens participation. My understanding is no one has signed up for citizen participation tonight. Right. We'll go to the next item, number six, discussion items, uh, superintendent's reports. Huh? Is there a hearing in there? All right. Oh, I missed. Okay. We're going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, number four, recogn uh, I'm lost. Okay. Number three. Not on mine, it's not. I'm just saying. Yeah, that's October 1st. Right here. Right here. Apparently, I'm on October 1st. I made it halfway through the agenda before we got there. <laughs> public hearing, school first. All right, we'll have a public hearing, school first, financial integrity rating system of Texas, report for fiscal year 2016 17 from T, uh, Texas Education Agency, Ms. Grimes. I'm reading from the wrong agenda. It's just one of those nights. Okay, we're going to. <laughs> Just go. Ugh. Nathan? Nathan Mc there you go. All right. All right. That's okay, I'll get off. Thank you though. Microphone. To your right. Turn it on. No, press the button. Green. Do I have to hold it? Can I set it down? Okay. Um, we're required to publish notice in the paper and hold a public hearing on the district's, district school's first integrity rating system of Texas. Um, the primary purpose of the first rating is to achieve quality performance in the management of the school district's finances. We are required to publish notice in the paper and, and we want to have uh, the public the chance to have this information and input. Um, The objective of the first rating is to assess and evaluate the quality of financial management decisions and then report those to the general public. The first rating um, also addresses future financial solvency of school districts and it's also considered by TEA when assigning a financial, a final accreditation status. So there's a numbering system and the number of points accumulated um, from 15 different indicators determine the possible ratings for a school district. A being superior, B above standard, C meets standard, or F is substandard achievement. So let's briefly cover the 15 indicators. Um, number one, did the district file the annual audit report with TEA on time? 
Yes, the audit report was received November 27, 2017. And number two is basically asking, is there a clean opinion issued by the auditors? Yes, there was an unmodified opinion received. 2B is basically, were there any instances of material weaknesses in internal controls? The answer is no. We passed that. Number three, has the district paid all debt owed, basically? Yes, we have. Number four, did the school district make timely payments to the TRS system and the Texas Workforce Commission and other various governmental agencies? Yes, we have. Whoops, we missed one. Number five, was the district's unrestricted net position greater than zero? And yes, it was. It was $53.7 million. Number six, basically, is the cash and current investments held by the district? District's general fund sufficient to cover 90 days of operating expenditures? Yes, we had 132 days cash on hand. And number seven, current assets to liability ratio? Is it greater than three to one? And our ratio was 3.39 to one. So all points were achieved on those two. Number eight, the question here is, is the ratio of long-term debt to total assets sufficient to support long-term solvency? Yes, the district's long-term debt ratio is .6881. And I always like to give an analogy. This question is like asking someone if their mortgage exceeds a certain percentage of the market value of their home. The district's debt is 69% of its total assets. So to achieve all 10 points on this question, the district's debt would have needed to be 60% or less. And I would point out, though, that although our debt is higher than 60%, the 60% threshold to gain the maximum points here, we're highly rated as a AA credit category by Moody's and Standard & Poor's. And with the permanent school fund guarantee, we have a triple credit A rating. We also were awarded all 10 points on this indicator since our change in student membership over the past five years was 7%. And 7% or greater would be the growth factor there. And ours was 7%. So we did gain all the 10 points, even though our debt to asset ratio was slightly high. Number nine, did the general fund revenues exceed expenditures? And they did. So we earned the maximum points on this indicator. Number 10, this indicator asks about the district's ability to make debt, principal, and interest payments that will become due during the year. Our coverage ratio is high at 1.973. Number 11, indicator, this measures the percent of the budget spent on administration. Ours is 8% compared to a threshold of 8.55%. So we gained those points as well. Number 12, this indicator assesses whether the district has had a decline in our students to staff ratio. However, since the student enrollment did not decrease, the district automatically passes this indicator. Number 13, it measures our PEAMS data to our annual audit, expecting variances to be lower than 3%, and they were. Number 14, was the audit free of any instances of material noncompliance for grants, contracts, and laws related to local, state, or federal funds? Yes, they were free of any material noncompliance issues. And then the final indicator, number 15, the district did not receive an adjusted repayment schedule for an overallocation of FSP funds resulting from a financial hardship. So the district received 100 out of 100 possible points. We achieved the A rating. I can't recall the number of years, but we've received that rating now for many years in a row. So with that, I would just ask if there are any questions. This is a public hearing. Do we have any questions from the public? Not everybody at once. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any from the board? Thank you, Ms. Brown. Do you have the financial management report as well? There's some copies. Available to those that are... We have some copies. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Carnes. Thank you. Now that I'm on the November 5th agenda, not October, whatever date that was, we're more in line here. All right, next item is citizen participation. Still, no one has signed up? Okay, so we have no citizen participation tonight. Next item is number six, discussion items, superintendent's reports. Yes, we have Dr. Gorte will be introducing our guest speaker tonight. Underneath report number one. I'm glad to welcome Dee Carney. Dee Carney works with Mo Casey out of Austin, Texas, and we have been partnering with Mo Casey to look at the risk load data for our campuses across the Goose Creek School District. She has provided a binder for each of you with all of the information that we've received, and then she's going to compile that into a briefer discussion of the information that you have. And in essence, this report, the whole purpose is the better we know our students, the better we can serve their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, President Poppe, board members, Mr. O'Brien, Dr. Gorte. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit more about risk loads. Just a different way of looking at students' educational needs. You may be familiar with Mo Casey for school finance, but we also have another group in our shop that works on school improvement and accountability. I'm on that side. No finance questions tonight for me. When you look at the past 10 years, the demographics in Goose Creek, you can see what's changed, right? Hispanic student enrollment up, white student enrollment down, African American student enrollment slightly down. You can see over those 10 years, you've grown about 3,000 kids. And when you look at the demographics this way by program eligibility, you can see economically disadvantaged students up about 7 percentage points, CTE student enrollment about 10 percentage points, ELL student enrollment about 4 percentage points. But what leaders include, what leaders at every level of the school system are being challenged is to think and act differently to successfully address the effects of income inequality. So why Goose Creek over 10 years has seen that 7 percentage point increase, that's as an average, right? When we look at all the campuses, it ranges from 52 percent economically disadvantaged up to 90 percent economically disadvantaged. And so how do we successfully address the educational difficulties and academic performance of our students? We've known for a long time, educators and researchers, we know there's just a complex set of factors that converge on districts and schools that make it challenging, right? They make it more or less challenging to teach all students to those high levels of rigor, such as what we require in Texas, the 60 by 30, right? The Higher Education Board Plan, which says that by 2030, at least 60 percent of Texans will have some type of post-secondary certificate or degree. When we talk about educational disadvantage, for the past 25 or 30 years, the proxy, the most readily available and consistent operational definition for that has been student eligibility for free and reduced price meals. That's known as economically disadvantaged. And here's the graphic I was referring to a minute ago. Last year, the percent of economically disadvantaged students enrolled in the district ranged from 52 percent to 90 percent, with the district average being 67 percent. Now, before we start talking about student educational needs and educational difficulties, we want to be very, very clear that when we're talking about poverty, it's not just a lack of money. It is not an excuse for poor teaching or school performance. It is, however, a shorthand for a lack of educational experiences. Thank you. 
When we began looking at risk load analysis, I was in Houston ISD at that time in research and accountability. And free and reduced price meals were not helping us understand. When nearly every student or every school has 80, 85 percent of their students qualify for free and reduced price meals, that doesn't help you understand some of the complex challenges facing kids, right? That can impact attendance and performance and engagement. So we needed a different definition of educational disadvantage. And that's when we started talking about what's in our students' data backpack. What are those things that kids bring with them to school every day? And to do that, we needed to look at different metrics. And we looked at risk loads, student need indexes. And so that's what we brought to Dr. Duarte and Mr. O'Brien back in 2016. Goose Creek was one of our very first early adopters when we were rolling out risk loads and helped us, gave us feedback on how to make it a more useful analysis for districts to use. So it's all about how do you allocate people, money, materials, and time? How do you allocate resources for schools based on unique student needs and not just one metric of free and reduced price meals? So risk load analysis brings in a variety of data. And if you look in your notebook on page five, you'll see we look at 26 different factors. And if you really want to know the definitions of them all, you can look on page 28, because that's what this screenshot is from. And you'll see we look at 10 program and demographic factors. And then on page 28, you can see where we get that data from, from PEAMS. And then we also look at six different school factors, ranging from suspension data to counselor to student ratios. And then we also bring in the census data, and we look at neighborhood factors. And there's the definition from child poverty rate to unemployment rate in the neighborhood, levels of education, even to homeless shelters that might be in the area. So you look at these, we look at these 26 factors, and we compare them. We compare the state, the district to the state for what data there is publicly available. And then we compare the campuses to the district. And here's what we found in 2017-18. The risk load factors varied. Some campuses had four risk load factors out of 26. And another campus had 19 out of 26. That's a significant range when you're talking about educational needs and supporting kids. Risk loads do not predetermine performance. When TEA rolled out the A through F accountability ratings, you can see some campuses had a B that had 18 or 19, excuse me, 17 or 18 risk loads. Others had a risk load of eight with a B. It helps set the context for the educational difficulties or the challenges within those campuses. If you will look on page 13, you'll find a heat map. And that heat map, you will see, includes the total risk load count. And then you'll find the 10 program or demographic risk factors. And that comes from the district sends us some of that data from PEAMS as well as the TAPR reports. There's six school factors. And there's 10 neighborhood factors. And you'll see all those various shades of reds and greens. And what that is just... What that tells you is green is lower risk, a lower risk than the district, and the reds are a higher risk. You count all the red cells, you count all the red, and that's why you get your total risk loads. 
the brighter the red, that's two standard deviations above or more than the district. The brighter the green, two standard deviations below. So that's how we can, we, we are able to look at and put some context around campuses that may have very similar free and reduced price meals forms, have about the same number of kids turning in their form, but it's not helping you understand or improving teaching and learning until you can have a better definition of poverty than just who turns in their form. At the far right-hand side of that chart, you'll see the star performance data. It's also red and green color-coded. We compare the district and the, and the campuses to the state average to get those color codings. And then we look for patterns and trends. We look for observations. We found some, made some key findings. We offer some recommendations and suggestions to the district. They don't have to take them. <laughs> Just recommendations. Do you have any questions about the heat maps? Um, you said, um, for example, look at Elementary. They're not listed up here in the screen. Yes. On page 13. I, I was asking in reference to the grade where it says they didn't have available more mass. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Was yes. that because their numbers are so low? That's correct. Yeah. That's right. It, uh, since it's STAR, we use publicly available data. And as you know, the TEA masks if there's a certain number. So that's what that is. Great question. So when we talk about poverty from an economical standpoint, but we also can look at poverty from an educational standpoint, meaning that we have poverty in the sense from the education they're getting from the people who are giving them the education, meaning that the quality of, of teachers that you have at certain schools may not be the standard which these kids who are impoverished or come from housing or, or, or poor neighborhoods or whatever, they're not getting what they need from school because of the, the education they're getting is impoverished also, meaning that the social environment they're used to at home, they're getting the same thing when they come to school, meaning that they can't learn if you don't have a learning curve at home either. So you don't have a learning curve at home, now you don't have a learning curve when you come to school, so you're getting the same thing. You know, it's like young uh, young men who come through elementary, through, you know, first through fifth grade. And they, they're not getting the education they need to have at home, but also they're not getting the education they need to have in school also. Because they're not listening at home. And, and a lot of these kids who are in the poverty range uh, uh, single family uh, homes. So you're getting nothing at home, so you get nothing in school either. So it's just a pass off. Like, well, you being, you, you're, you're bad, you, you're doing so, now I'm just going to pass you off and, and not worry about you. So how can we say that the poverty at home is not totally related to the poverty at school in, in both both senses. So is it is it a, a, a group thing that you're getting nothing at school or you, and you're getting nothing at home or is it 
more you're not getting nothing at home because of your impoverished way you live it. That's the question that we've been trying to answer. I know since I've been on the board, you know, why is it that young men at in elementary do poorly in reading and just carry over into junior high? And then when they get to junior high, a certain time in junior high, it picks back up. Then all of a sudden it drops when they get to high school. So, but the poverty range, you see kids kind of raising themselves. So when they come to school and you got key teachers who are not on that bus to see what they're dealing with every year. So they don't know what these kids are coming from. So I'm just saying poverty goes both ways. You're getting poverty at school and you're getting poverty in the neighborhood. So how can we, from the data you've collected, how can we fix, you know, where they're getting something from one or the other? If they're not getting it at home, we need to make sure that they're getting it at school. So that's my basic question. You know, it's like, how can we determine which way, you know? That was the basic version? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you, you look at it from, a, you know, from an African-American standpoint, and I see kids growing themselves in my neighborhood. You know, boom, when you get seven, eight years old, and you can use a microwave, damn, you good. You know, but when you go to school, you know, and the teacher's trying to teach you something, you don't understand it, you know, damn, you're a bad kid. Now, you go on to the principal's office. So, my thing is, you know, you're saying that poverty is not a, 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 a reason why these kids are not learning. And I'm saying poverty is one of the reasons they're not learning. I would agree with you. Yeah. Poverty is, but we want to expand that definition so we can try to allocate resources to address what those needs are. When you look at some of the campuses here that have similar free and reduced price meal forms, right? But they have different, when you expand that definition and look at other metrics of poverty, you can see different campuses have different needs. Their students have different needs. For example, I'm just going to give a couple of examples. Uh, one of our districts in the Central Texas area, who also has risk loads, did exactly what you're doing here. They shared it with the board, but they also shared it with their community, and they shared it with the university, who said, you know what? We have 27 master's degree-seeking social workers that need 250 clinical hours. We want those students in your highest needs campuses. So they were able to use their risk load data and provide additional support. The district had no way they could pay 20, you know, hire 27 social workers. But that's a way this information can be used to attack, if you will, or to address some of those needs that the kids bring with them. We're, we're very upfront with you, and if you look on page four, you'll see it. We say, you know, neither the district or the school can control all these factors. That's, that's understood. However, if you have a, a better understanding of those factors, you can address them, right? You, you can begin to address them. We have another district right down the road here. When it's at the beginning of the year, this is, they've had, they're like Goose Creek, and they have had multiple years of risk loads. At the beginning of the year, they no longer pull teachers from high risk load campuses to level classes across the district. They understand that at high risk load campuses, those are greater educational degrees of difficulty. Those students need smaller class sizes. So these are some decisions they've made having different data available to help make those decisions. But we agree with you. It's not an excuse for poor school performance. It's not an excuse for poor teaching, but it does impact teaching and learning. I think that one of the things that, that this might help us understand is, is exactly that. Uh, as a school district, to understand that 
some areas need more resources because of the of our students that we serve that have um, I'll, I'll give for example here's a campus that's a high turnover rate that I'm going to have issues with some of their students or some of their testing and I think that, that that's one thing that as a district uh, Mr. Sampson that we should definitely take into account when looking at these things I know we had one of uh, these last year I really appreciate the fact that, that you came and you guys Dr. Lockby you, you, you were able to bring uh, OPCM because this, this I think as a district helps us understand and try to address exactly what Mr. Sampson is saying because it's no use if you have a kid and, and while there are different factors in different communities but overall some of the communities some of this stuff isn't surprising to us because we've lived here our whole lives and, and I think um, but I think what Mr. Sampson was attempting to say is you have a situation at home where you have kids that are that are not only suffering from economic poverty but they're suffering from from social poverty or from not being able to have sometimes because mom and dad have to both work and you know then they go to school and, and because these kids our kids in these in these neighborhoods have already social issues anxieties issues, whatever then they come to school and the teachers aren't maybe prepared it's kind of like having that teacher that has been there forever and they're the AP teacher and they're the seasoned <laughs> great teacher and then you put the new teacher with the kids that that are the you know what, what the state consider at risk and uh, you know you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot and, and I think that this is a good opportunity Mr. Bryan for us as a school district to be able to address some of these situations and make sure that our kids that are in those schools that need extra support get it not only through us providing you know staffing or whatever but making sure we have the right kind of staff at these schools to help address the kids. I agree. You know, we're accustomed to it's sort of a turning turning a corner. Uh, we're accustomed to TEA tells us our class ratio, 22 to 1 for elementary and on down the line, junior high and high school. And that's what we're accustomed to doing. And even we as administrators have in the, uh, been customary, we have to be fair across the district. Every campus gets the same, uh, you know, class count. And we're having to reevaluate that and, and back up and, and review the risk load data and say, no, you're right. We need more staff on this campus because their needs are greater. So we're having to do individualized recommendations per campus need. And uh, that's exactly what I think both of you are talking about. We're looking at it from a staffing standpoint per ratio, but the other wet thing that you just mentioned was the quality of teaching staff at a campus, not moving them and things of that nature. I, I have one more question. Yes, sir. And I'm sorry. Um, one thing that, that I kind of look for a little bit, and maybe, you know, we're kind of combing it over you. Know, sure. But, uh, one of the things that, that uh, I'll, I'll give an example, we used to have a after school program through communities and schools that serve most of our elementary school campuses because of grant and the recession and everything, some of those had to go away. But there's uh, organizations such as the YMCA that have provided those programs, but because those programs cost money, those programs obviously don't go to the areas that probably have the highest amount of need. So uh, one thing I was looking for in here was there was that kind of program, the difference in, as um, to me, as me it, it, sorry, that would be another risk factor or something to consider is the fact that, for example, I, I think uh, Victoria Walker has a YMCA after school program, but Carver does not. And I know, once again, it's economics because I'm not trying to no, you know, say anything like, I thank the YMCA for having that, that, that ability yeah. to do that in some of our schools. But I think that, that um, as a school district, looking at, at what areas have to offer for our students to further support. And so the really great thing is we give Dr. Duarte a flash drive with all this data. And she can add to it those okay. pieces that you may want to see. Right? Well, you, underneath the community. Uh, uh, absolutely. You could, you could add to it as you'd like. We selected these 26 factors based on the educational research that shows some type of correlation between attendance, engagement, and performance um, for students. But that's a great idea as well. How many times have we had this at risk group? This is your second risk load report. The baseline report was completed in 2016, the first year we began running risk loads. I knew there was at least, I knew, I knew we had at least two. I just you did? Yes, sir. So what have you seen other districts do? I mean, I know that you know, we budgeted on our first student allocation. You uh, bet. Do they, have any of them taken this data and developed something like in the school funding, like a cost of education index, maybe a little, if 
you have X number of factors, your student allocation is increased by times 1.01 or 1.02 or something to that effect to help those campuses with higher load. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We've had some superintendents that have had to have some hard conversations because of their budget situation. And this data allows them to, along with their board, to make some decisions about moving those funds from campuses that may have a risk load of 5 to campuses that have risk loads of 17, 18, and 19. And just as Mr. O'Brien talked about, we have seen other districts look at that staffing allocation formula and say, you know what, yep, typically you get 500 kids, you get a new librarian or a new nurse or a new this or a new that. With high risk load campuses, we've got to do something a little bit different. So what have you seen that some campuses do? I know we talked about staffing, and we're all talking about teacher, teacher, teacher. Sure. There's a lot of staffing you can do that aren't teacher. That's true. Instructional aids, more aids to help in the classrooms of those schools. Those cost one-third of a teacher class. You can get more bang for your buck. All we have are just some anecdotal things. Yeah, speaking of ideas. Yeah, some anecdotal things that other superintendents. This is great information. Yeah. And then the other piece would be there are some campuses in here that are doing terrific. Absolutely. With high loads. You know, are we going to those? What are they doing? You know, I mean, are we replicating? That's a real plus. That's a feedback loop. Absolutely. They're not a silo by themselves. They're doing great. What are they doing that this campus over here isn't doing? What are they doing? That's true. It's an opportunity for us to improve. I appreciate the report. Absolutely. It's great information. I look forward to learning how you use it. Us too. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you. Next up, we have our GCCIC employment report. Mr. Chapa, Dr. White, Dr. Sylvester. Good evening, Mr. President, Mr. O'Brien, and members of the board. The Goose Creek CISD Human Resources Department is here tonight to share with you our annual personnel report. With me tonight are Dr. Wyatt and Dr. Sylvester. I'd like to remind the board that this data that we're looking at tonight is from October the 1st of 2017 to September 30th, 2018. And leading us off tonight is going to be Dr. Wyatt. Okay. There's a lot of data on here, and I'm going to try to go through it semi-quickly just so we're not here all night long. But if I do go through too fast, feel free to throw something at me, and I will slow down and repeat myself if I need to. Here we're looking at all professional employees. This is basically anyone, our degree employees who are not teachers, librarians, assistant principals, principals, the three of us, everybody else. On the left is all, that's all employees in the district as of October 1st of this year. And then to the side is our new hires. This is a demographic breakdown just so you can kind of see the racial ethnic background of our new hires compared to our total professional employee staff. This is our teaching staff, same data. Paraprofessional staff. Auxiliary staff. This is looking at similar data but looking at it by department. So these are all campus level employees, professional and non-professional. The blue is all employees. The gray is our new hires. So you can just kind of compare by those levels. Central administration hires. Business services. One thing I did find when we divide this way, this is one employee. They only hired one employee, so, you know. You'll see the same thing when we hit HR. There we go. You know, it's not as useful when it's a small group, but TMS. 
curriculum instruction department food service maintenance department our operations custodial transportation and police and security and our construction and planning department who didn't hire anybody this year so I'm going to talk about uh, qualifications of, of new hires if you look where it says certification certificates pending out of state uh, those are the individuals who have applied for review credentials with the state and uh, they, they're on a Texas one year and the key thing about it takes us one year is, is one year we have to keep reminding people of that it's actually one year so uh, they re, they have they've had a review of credentials also the certificates pending due to ACP CTE at 1% uh, those are individuals who still have some remaining components with their ACP program that they need, that they need to complete to become uh, to get the credentials that are necessary to be a, a teacher in a, in a Texas school system and then the licensure of 3% uh, those are, are, are the nurses you know, within the organization New hires by highest degree earned. Uh, the associate's degree, uh, those are associated with, with nurses and CTE teachers. And also, uh, the no degree required at 1% uh, are, are CTE teachers as, as well. New hires by years of experience. Uh, it's, it's important to kind of see the, uh, as in the, the whole graph as a whole. If you look, you'll notice that 65% of the of the new hires have at least one year of experience and you'll see that approximately 40 percent have at least four years of experience so 40 percent of, of the individuals that we hired new to the organization they have at least four years of, of experience so that's that's a good thing new hires by campus uh the three percent i want to clarify, clarify those are individuals at Stewart career tech high school or either sped services and then ACP hires by campus. Uh, what I want to point out here is that within the last two years, uh, ACPs have, have surpassed traditional programs, and they are the lead certification certifying agencies uh, within the state. So it's really no longer an alternative certification. It's really the, the norm as, as it stands. I think it's like 52% of the teachers uh, within the state of Texas were certified through ACP programs. And, and I only and I only think it's going to get greater. It's going to get bigger because uh, the universities are not putting out the level of, of talent that is needed within the organization. So I, I look for that number to even uh, grow uh, as as we go further within the years. An interesting uh, statistics TEA shared was um, last year the number one university as far as creating brand certifying new teachers was Texas State University, and they certified about 600 new teachers. The number one ACP program was Texas Teachers, and they did about 6,000 new teachers. So it's a massive disparity between uh, universities and ACP. We've only had ACP since, what, the mid-90s? Was it that um, one? Like mid-90s? Probably yeah, around the uh, late 90s. Yeah. yeah. Around 96, 95, around in there. So all Started 25 years, it was now over half, half the teachers. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. Here we have all, all employees uh, in the district by uh, district tenure, and you kind of look around and you see those with one to three years, uh, six to seven years, uh, pretty much all uh, equaled out there. And then we have uh, teachers in the district uh, tenure, and you see those split out as well. Uh, the thing that I like about this graphic is if you look at it and you take the ones that are from 20, 21 to 31 years, and you kind of combine those, it's pretty well split up uh, into five equal pieces, uh, percentage-wise. And then the separation by employment, if you will look at this, uh, they're really the top five, uh, four reasons, the top four reasons uh, why uh, we have employees right now that are telling us that they're leaving the district at number one uh, by 16.2% uh, is a career advancement. The second one is by for personal reasons, and number three is retirement, and number four is moving or family circumstances, which are really, really close at 10.1 and 10.4%.
We've also shared some of this data, and it was preliminary data, with our strategic planning committee, and we're looking to go ahead and explore that and try and grow that through our strategic planning committee and trying to dig a little bit deeper as far as why teachers do leave and trying to look at ways and why we can create ways to have teachers stay in the district. And then in our exit interview responses, the questions that we normally ask, if you look at this, most of the responses fall between excellent and fair. We want to move some of those responses from fair either to the excellent column or to the good column. But that's generally our report. Do we have any questions? We have goals. What are our goals for new hire? Do you have an internal goal for years of experience with new teachers? One of the things that we did last year at the insistence of Mr. O'Brien was we started looking at hiring staff much, much sooner in the year, and I think that our early retirement incentive plan really helps out a great deal with that. We saw last year, because we waited so late to start hiring people, that a lot of our July and August hires really did not pan out. So our goal is to try and post as quickly as we can legally and try and hire the best qualified people as soon as possible. Do you have like matrix? You want to hire 40 percent of your teachers to be five years plus experience? How do you score yourself? I mean, what do you have? I mean, do we have those goals? I don't know if we even have them. We have not developed those goals. You made a comment that, you know, not you, but the comment was made that, you know, 40 percent of our five years plus or four years plus. I mean, do we have targets? Do we have goals? Do we just, whatever comes our way, we just do the, I mean, I'm just asking. I don't know. No. Well, no, we don't have it broken down into a matrix at this point, but that's something we can certainly look at. But one of the greatest tools that we have for getting more experienced people is through our recruitment efforts as far as the job fair that we have here at Goose Creek. That's a big plus. And having that earlier in the year. Well, yeah, by hiring earlier, I mean, we were always two months behind everybody. Exactly. The blue chippers are gone. You know, they've already been scooped up by all the neighboring districts, and we're one notch down, you know, or whatever. I mean, we still got good teachers, and we do great training for them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, but by getting us earlier in the game is definitely going to be a plus for us. Absolutely. I appreciate that effort. I wanted to ask you about your strategic planning that you've recently gone through as a group. Part of that might have been to compare some of this data with previous year's data to show how that trend is changing, as in, for example, I would like to see some data that shows the certification. How many teachers with a master's degree or a Ph.D. or other types of certificates are we hiring more now or less now than we have in the past? Tracking that data, I think, would be an important part of helping to formulate a strategic plan and then using that same plan to start earlier, move faster, get better, more experienced hires in earlier and, you know, see what we can set up as a goal. One thing that we are, I'm sorry, sir. One thing we are doing is, this is only our second year actually coming and bringing this report, and so we are keeping track of the stuff from year to year. We didn't include it in here because I thought showing two years of data wasn't really good longitudinal. Hey, here's where we are. But our plan is to start doing that so when we have a few more years, at least one more, then we can start showing, hey, here's our, we'll put in a three-year piece with all of these things so that way we have the same data multiple years in a row and we kind of see if there is a trend one way or the other, and we can just keep adding. Two years doesn't really give you good results, but it does get you started. And I would like to see it, at least what you've started tracking from. One of the things that we're also doing, and thanks to Dr. Duarte, is through the allocation committee is in dual credit classes that we're offering at the high school. For those dual credit classes, those teachers need to have a master's degree within their content areas. So that is one of our goals for us to be able to offer more dual credit classes at the high school, therefore looking at more staff that have those master's degree in those content areas and allocating those funds so that we can go ahead and pay those individuals for those advanced degrees. The longitudinal data will also allow you the opportunity to do forecasting and projecting instead of guessing wildly at some target you want. Absolutely. You look at where you're at and you set your targets according to that. One question, and I know I went one question too far on the other, but 
this is an important factor to me, diversity. What is and how many, since we are considered a minority district with 62% and 14% African American and 62% Hispanic, what are we doing about diversity trying to hire where kids see people that look like them and also kids in elementary see adults that look like them, particularly figures, like I said before, that you have a lot of single family households. And we talk about discipline and everything, but diversity. And that's what I like to see a report on in the last two years is where are we on diversity? Because in all of your conversation, none of that was brought up about diversity. It was just about teacher hire, teacher experience, and things of that nature, but it's nothing about diversity. I believe it was in there. If y'all want to slide back to that slide, you can show him we had a difference just in the two years that it's been measured. There was a significant difference in diversity employment. Yeah. Well, that wasn't two years against one another. No, that's all. Yeah, this is it's this is all of our new hires compared to our current employees versus okay. new hires. Yeah. So we need last year's. Yeah, we're gonna wait right on next year until mm -hmm. we have three years of data to show that. <laughs> but you can see even with that all versus new, um, there's a significant difference. That's non-teachers. You can go to teachers and see that too. The pie chart for minority is getting larger. For my boys overall, but uh, yes. my question is, how do we attract more minority or diverse people to come apply? Well, uh, I know like some things that we've been doing is we've been trying to uh, work, reach out to some of uh, our different universities that we haven't uh, used before um, or that we haven't had a really strong relationship with. We're trying to build up that relationship, bring in more student teachers. Um, we've reached out to uh, Texas Southern. Um, we've reached out to Prairie View A&M. Actually, I believe we're going to have, I believe it was Prairie View A&M. We actually are going to have a student teacher next year. We haven't had a student teacher for Prairie View A&M in quite a while. So, no, Texas Southern. Southern. Okay. Okay. And so we're really trying to increase our presence in different places. And actually, uh, tomorrow I'm leaving. I'm going down to the Valley to do recruiting. Um, so we really are trying to go other places to bring people in and to show them how great our area is. Other questions? Any other questions? All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is item number seven, approval of minutes. We have the approval of minutes for the October 1st, 2018 regular board meeting. Do we have a motion? I'll move to approve the minutes as presented. We have a motion by Ms. Jessica Woods. We have a second. We have a second by Mr. Howard Sampson. That's the first one. Yeah, the first one. Okay. Uh, do we have any discussion? All in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All right, motion passes 7 0. Uh, item B uh, minutes from the October 16, 2018 board workshop slash special meeting. Do we have a motion? I'll move to approve minutes as presented. We have a motion by Ms. Jessica Woods. We have a second. Second. We have a second, Mr. Ben Poppy. Any further questions? Any discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Did you raise your hand, Mr. Sharp? Okay, I thought you did, sorry. Uh, any opposed? Any abstain? All right, for the record, six yeas, zero nay, one abstain. All right, number, uh, number eight, action items. Our first action items, uh, number A, consideration of Goose Creek CSD Comprehensive Annual Finance Report, AKA the CAFR for the year in of June 30, 2018. Administration recommends approval. All right. Do we have a, how balance? much is fund balance? Do we have questions, fund balance, any findings? Do you have a healthy fund balance? Healthier. Healthier. How much did it go up? Was it 20, 18? 17. 17? No findings? He's got one thing. Go ahead. Who? I, 
accepted. All right. All in favor, uh, raise your right hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay. One abstention. Did you? No, Mr. Sampson abstained. He abstained. Did you vote for it? Did vote yes? Okay, I just missed the yes part. Yeah. All right, so we have six yeses, zero nays, one abs abstentia, and we have number 11. Uh, the DCSD strategic plan. Mr. Clem? If you refer back to our minutes on page 74, um, and we discussed this at the workshop with Dr. Mack, um, he recommended that 50% of our goals be academic, 20% employee related, et cetera, down to 10% financial. And if we look through what's presented to us to vote on tonight, it doesn't fall, in my opinion, it's not even close to that ratio. Um, in fact, it, it, it may be inside out of that. And if, if I, I would be more comfortable having more academic goals and I, and I also, I'm going to just jump out there. I felt like things were presented to us so fast at that workshop that we didn't realize that that was the night to hash this out and say these kinds of things. Because I, I left that workshop going, what happened? So I, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with what's presented to us right now. I feel the same way. Just FYI, I don't know how everybody else feels, but uh, I think it's... It's uh, been a lot of hard work. I mean, I, I appreciate it. I just think we're we're at one we're one level away from where we really need to be. I think there's a couple of areas that I've expressed with the superintendent. I won't say which one's here, but I think there's a couple of areas we need to get more away from the yes no and to the target. Here's the percent. Here's what we want to do. Uh, some areas did a fantastic job in that. But I think there's a, a couple of areas we just need to just fine tune a little bit, tweak it. But to Mr. Clem's point, we need to get more on the academic. Way. And that was just my example. Yeah. I, I, that was a concern I had. The, you had that. The whole people. process was amazing. I enjoyed oh, it was watching great. it happen. I enjoyed visiting all the committees and seeing how they formulated their goals. But the, the end product is I want to see more than just the annual test scores in our academic Plus. goals of the strategic plan. Um, and I think we all agree that Mrs. Grimes and her her staff are going to meet all of their goals all the time, so it, maybe it doesn't need to be, you know, a third of, of what we're seeing there in our goals, or or a quarter, whatever. Sorry, I don't do math. But it, this, some of the things are out of proportion to me, especially if we're going to take Dr. Max's recommendation. We will, um, I mean, it's the board's pleasure. We'll be glad to reevaluate and reassess the weight given to more align with what you pointed out there on page 74. Uh, the team, I think, uh, our administrative team can work together to get that done without a whole lot of further. And, and the other thing I would have asked for at the workshop, had I realized that was the night to ask for it, was uh, CNI gave us pretty much 10 things they had talked about. And, and the other committee just says, here's the ones we want to give you. I'd like to see the depth of where they took that and see if there are things in there that we would like to be monitoring versus leaving to, to the annual report, so to speak. So just personally, I'm not comfortable approving it tonight. I think we missed a step. I don't think it's just the, the academic part, though. I think there's other parts of this that I, I would like. And I think I've, I've talked to you about that, Mr. Bryan. There's other parts that I, I think I, I need a little bit more information on. Well, and maybe the depth of what they were doing has some of that in it that can exactly. just be plugged in. For example, in HR, uh, some, some goals uh, for hiring diversity, hiring higher qualified, longer term experience, you know, some of those kinds of things being included in the strategic plan that can be uh, measured for results over a you know one two three year period uh same thing for academics i mean we have this great report from Mo casey tonight what are we going to do with it um, those kinds of things i'd like to see in the strategic plan what what are our intentions for these higher uh risk campuses um how do we intend to use this information going forward those are things that need to be in that strategic plan and that could help um fatten it up, so to speak, to reach the 50% of the, the strategic planning process. And 
and Margie's only, only responsible for 10% of that planning process. So <laughs> you got a tiny slice of the pie. Uh, from the sounds of this conversation, this discussion, it's a healthy one. Thank you for the feedback. I'd like to uh, recommend withdrawing number 11 from board consideration this evening. And that puts us on to number C. Uh, letter C, future board agenda items, board training, board meetings. Uh, future board agenda items. Number one, does the, any board members have any uh, request uh, for future board agenda items? Or board training, any board training, Ms. Garcia? Wednesday at the Gulf Coast area. And that is... Uh, well, what is the topic? I mean, there's something particular to this meeting. Uh, they're having their the membership here. interim yeah. meeting. Um, we have barbers are going to be there too. They're, they're having the school have first five. update with the change things, right? Uh, scorecard. Yeah, scorecard. Mm -hmm. Okay. I knew there was something on there. It was just gotcha, gotcha. And that is region four at six. It starts at thirty. Leave here about four. All right, region four at six thirty. All right, any other trainings upcoming that we are aware of? I don't think we have any. NSBA, y'all can let me know. That's April, March, April, March the thirty-first. Okay, March thirtieth through April one. And that's NSBA in Philadelphia. All right. I guess they're going to be cold though. Do we have uh, any future board meetings? I would really like us to have a post-it meeting specific for the strategic plan so we can discuss openly amongst the seven of us. Do you want to have a meeting or like a workshop? Workshop. Okay. Just some, whatever we need to do so the seven of us can talk all together about how we want this to look okay. when it grows up. Uh, when it grows up. <laughs> Uh, giving the administration a couple of weeks. Uh, we got Thanksgiving coming up. So the last week of November, we have a regular board meeting, whatever the first Monday December is. I don't know off the top of my the head. Third. The third. The third. December third. All right, I can't get past Thanksgiving right yet. But okay, so December third. Uh, we have the last week of November, and then I don't think you want to get past December, January. We're getting too late. Uh, yeah, we'd this like to that, adopt uh, it December 3rd, retreat if possible. That, that we were talking about? Uh, the last week of November? Huh? The strategic planning retreat? Yeah. One of the recommendations uh, that Ms. Woods and I got to spend last week in San Antonio with Dr. McGuire in some uh, training, as we were trained on the Baldur's Method and how to be examiners. Or, but we had, did have an opportunity to, to, to speak with Dr. McGuire, and uh, you know, one of his recommendations was that the board took some time to have a retreat to where we can look at the strategic plan once we got it, get it done. And then take that to the next level is that all, you know, everything ties together. So you have the strategic plan, and then we develop the, the scorecards, those things all tied to the superintendent evaluation. I mean, it's all, it's all, a, 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 should be all said and done, a very structured and smooth process. But he did recommend that we have a retreat sometime December, January time frame once, once we get it you know, finalized. Uh, then to figure out the next steps, because this is really just a step. This, this is a huge step, but it's a step one in, in a process of a few other steps. So, if you want to just keep that in your mind, because I don't think we can combine it with the uh, with the workshop on the getting the strategic plan done. I mean, although we can have that discussion, uh, and, and if we don't feel we need the retreat afterwards, then we're, we're good because we, if we do it. But what is everybody? I'm just thinking on the workshop. I mean, what is everybody's? I mean, last week, November, that would be right with the week before we have a regular meeting. That will give administration a week and a two, week, two weeks before a break. Is that right? Or my week off? My wife has not put anything on my calendar that week yet. Okay. <laughs> the week after Thanksgiving? Yeah. yeah what is, what is the other date? Sorry. I'm not 26th to the 30th. All right. The 26th to the 30th. You said 29th to Thursday? How does everybody's calendar look on the 29th of November? Soccer started. Uh-oh, soccer. Back up, back up. 
soccer starts, we won't see Mr. Laredo very often. He's a busy man. <laughs> the life of a coach. I'm not available on the 29th. Okay. I'm available up until the 29th, but not the 29th, 30th, or 1st. You're available 26, 27, 28? Yes. Any of those days work for you? Talk to me. Maybe the 26th. 26th? The Monday? Works for Al, Ricky, yep. Ben, Augustine, said yay, me, uh, How, Howard, Jessica, Jessica. 26. So. All right, 26. That's a miracle. 6.30. That is a miracle. Two, there, are two, two, there are some stars That's somewhere awesome. lining up right now. So. Yeah. Soccer gear. Soccer gear, all right. Uh, 6.30. Six you uh, Jessica, six thirty. Yeah. Six thirty. Yeah. Seven over there. <coughs> <coughs> Six thirty or seven? Everybody, either Six way. Six thirty. All right. Yeah, but okay. Okay. All right. Six thirty, November twenty-sixth. We'll have a workshop, and that will give the administration some time to update a few things. So can get that discussion. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next next item D. Closed meeting. Sorry. What did I say? Closed meeting. Closed session. Uh, the board now recess into closed session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Texas Government Code Section 551.071, 072, 073, 074, 075, 076, 082, 083, 084, 087. No action will be taken while the board is in closed meeting. Time is 8.05 p.m. Mr. Tritico, Mr. Gilbert, we'll call you all back in just a moment, okay? Thank you. To deny Mr. Torres's grievance. Second. We have a motion from Ms. Woods, a second from Mr. Ricky Clinton. We have any discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. That motion passes 7 0. Uh, we will be going back into closed session for personnel again under yep, 955. 551-071-072-073-074-075-076-082-083-084-087. Again, no action will be taken while the board is in closed session. Uh, we're coming back out of closed session. A reminder, no action was taken while we were in closed session. Uh, the administration would recommend that the board accept the resignation and retirements as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion, Mr. Augustine Laredo, a second, Mr. Ben Poppy. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0, and do note for the record, uh, Mr. Howard Sampson left approximately 10, 10 p.m. Administration now recommends the uh, approval of the elections as presented. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Augustine Laredo, second by Mr. Ricky Clem. Do we have any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Administration recommends Vanessa Trailer, a social worker interventionist at Peter E. Highland Center and Impact Early College High School. We have a motion. Motion for approval. Second. We have a motion, Mr. Augustine Laredo, a second from Mr. Al Rashard. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. 
Motion passes 6-0. Administration recommends Sandra Munnerland as occupational therapist. We have a motion. Move approval. Second. We have a motion on Mr. Alvishar and a second on Mr. Ricky Clown. Do we have any further discussion? All in favor raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Administration recommends Mitzi Oliver as counselor at Dr. Antonio Banuelos Elementary. We have a motion. Approve. Second. We have a motion on Mr. Ricky Clown and a second on Mr. Ben Poppe. Any further discussion? All in favor raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Administration recommends Ika Wildridge as coordinator of college and career guidance. We have a motion. Move approval. Second. We have a motion on Ms. Jessica Woods, a second on Ms. Augustine Laredo. Any further discussion? All in favor raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Still have one more. Okay, I was just double checking myself. There's two Mitzis. Administration recommends Mitzi Hall as behavior management specialist. We have a motion. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion. Mr. Ben Poppe, a second on Ms. Augustine Laredo. Any further discussion? All in favor raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Administration rests. Move to approve. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. It's been moved. We have a motion. Mr. Rick Clam, second. Ben Poppe, all in favor raise your right hand. Motion passes. Meeting is adjourned 10-32 p.m. Just for the record, I have to raise my left hand. I saw that. But I didn't want to say and call you out in public like that. Thank you.